Good morning, church family. As you're aware, we are in the Gospel of John. If you're new or you're visiting, our church uh, begun, began a series in the Gospel of John back in the spring, and we find ourselves at the beginning of John chapter 7 this morning. John chapter 7, uh, if you are using a, P, a Bible that's in the pew, it's on page 892. So if you want to be turning there in your Bible or in the church Bible, page 792 or John 7, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 36. Why don't we uh, stand for the reading of God's Word? John 7, 1 through till 36. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee... He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world." For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, because, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up. Not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, Not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is this... Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and you do not know, or and and him you do not know. I know him, for I have come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Pharisees heard the crowd muttering about these things. These things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little while longer, 
and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. And let's ask God for his assistance this morning. Father, I thank you for the people gathered in this room, for my brothers and sisters, for our friends, for this church family. So grateful to belong to Maple Avenue Baptist Church. And I am grateful that in this place, your word is central. And the gospel of Jesus is prized because of the Spirit's operation in our hearts and in our midst. And I pray that this morning, your name and your word would be put on display, that your Son would be exalted in our midst, and that we would see Jesus in his beauty, in his splendor, in his glory, and that we in our hearts would be attracted to him that you would draw out of our hearts affection for Jesus because he is worthy of our love and our adoration and of our devotion. I pray that even as we look at a difficult text in many respects, that you would help us to receive it as your word to us, even here this morning. I would imagine that in a room of this size, that there would be unbelievers in our midst, those who have not yet made the commitment to follow Jesus. I pray that you would particularly be at work in their hearts moving away the distractions, breaking um, up the hardness of heart, and helping them to see the unreasonableness of not believing in Jesus. I pray that you would assist us. I pray that you would help us in these few moments that we have together. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. How amazing... Would it have been to be alive when Jesus walked the earth? How amazing would it have been to hear his teaching? Jesus was here. Every last preacher in this room would be glad to sit down to hear his words alone. His teaching was with authority, unlike the religious leaders of the day. His teaching was filled with apt and colorful illustrations from the agrarian society to which he belonged. His teaching was, as we heard last week from Brother Matt, life-giving. Or would it not have been marvelous to see his miracles? Just imagine, you drive 30 minutes up the road, to Brampton Civic Hospital, which most of you know is overrun with patients because in a city of one million, they only have one hospital. And you go up to the cancer unit, to the oncology ward, and you walk from room to room, watching and observing as Jesus heals patient after patient. Now, how about this way of thinking? As believers, we might say it would would have been so wonderful to observe the miracles and hear the teaching of Jesus. That would have been cool. It's more out of a, a heart of curiosity. But sometimes you hear this way of thinking, this line of thinking, and it comes from the mouths of those who do not yet believe in Jesus, and it goes like this. If I physically saw the miracles of Jesus with my own eyes, I would believe in him. Trust me, I would believe him. If God showed up, and gave me a clear, bona fide miracle, I would follow him. What is interesting is that there was a group of people that Jesus knew like, or that knew Jesus like none other. They spent a lot of time with him. They ate meals with him. They heard his teaching. They saw the miracles he performed, and they had a close relationship with him. Do you know who I'm talking about? Some of you may have said, The disciples, 
And it's true, they were close to Jesus. But the people that I have in mind this morning are actually the brothers of Jesus. Technically, the half-brothers of Jesus because they shared a common biological mother, but they did not share a common biological father. At this point, in the Jesus story, the half-brothers of Jesus do not believe in him. So then, if you're this morning... And you'd say something like, if I saw the miracles of Jesus, I would believe. If God gave to me a miracle, I would believe, I think, is misguided. There are going to be three points in the sermon. And the main thing that I want to point out to you this morning is this. Jesus was sent into the world to dwell among us, but the world misunderstood his identity and sought to kill him. Jesus was sent into the world to dwell among us, but the world misunderstood his identity and sought to kill him. To put it more succinctly, we could say, to misunderstand Jesus is deadly. And I mean that in two different ways, and we'll expand on that as we move throughout the sermon. To misunderstand Jesus is deadly. Point number one, or movement number one, the brothers failed to believe in him. I'm choosing my words deliberately there. The brothers failed to believe in him. 7, 1 through 13. 1 through 13, the brothers failed to believe in him. So we spent the last few weeks in John chapter 6. At the beginning of John chapter 6, there's the feeding of the 5,000. And then there is the bread of life discourse, which follows... And after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus has been staying in the region of Galilee, which is in northern Israel. And he was avoiding Judea, which is southern Israel, for the very simple reason that there are a bunch of angry religious leaders in Judea, particularly in the capital, who wanted to kill him. Right? He was avoiding Judea because people there wanted to kill him. It's a good reason to stay away from an area. Now, the passage in John 7... The events there took place during the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths was a celebration on the Jewish calendar which took place in the fall. The feeding of the 5,000 took place during Passover which took place in the spring. All that to say between John 6 and John 7, there would have been about a half a year of time that had elapsed. So the brothers were about to head down to the Feast of Booths. And remember, the feast was associated with the fall harvest. This feast would have lasted about a week, and on the eighth day, there would have been a great celebration sort of to, as the culmination of the feast. People living in rural areas would have made structures made out of wood and uh, or out of you know, branches and leaves and then live in them for a week, sort of like camping in your backyard during the summer or something like that. And then people in the towns did similar things. They, they built these structures and they placed them on their flat roof or they put them up in their courtyards. And of the three major festivals on the Jewish calendar, the Feast of Booths was actually the most popular. And remember, at the end of John 6, the passage that Matt preached to us last week, Jesus has been bleeding a lot of followers He has lost a lot of devotees. So the brothers, being the loving brothers that they were, I say that somewhat sarcastically, have an idea for Jesus. Hey, Jesus, look, listen. It's festival time. Everyone's going to be in the capital. If you want to be famous, as you seem to want to be well-known, and you want a following, hey, here, look, here's our bullet proof plan. Go down to Judea and do the same thing that, you, that you've done up here down there and show yourself to the world. But notice John's comment in verse 5. The brothers said this out of unbelief. Even his own brothers did not understand who he was or why he had come. So the brothers imposed their ideas, and their plans on Jesus. In other situations, it is excusable, isn't it, to impose 
your great plans upon your siblings. But in this case, their brother happened to be the son of God and long-awaited Messiah, and so it was, shall we say, inappropriate. Jesus says, hey, look, listen. It's not time for me to go down to the feast yet. My life is set to a divine schedule, and I do not operate according to the world's clock. But you're of the world, so you can go down at any time. Any time's good for you because you just operate according to the world's clock. And notice with me, just as we move away from this first section, that Jesus' brothers are included in the broader category called the world. That's very interesting because Jesus' brothers were obviously related to him. Jesus' brothers were of the Jewish nation. Jesus' brothers, we would presume, had some sort of um, earthly or horizontal relationship with Jesus. And yet, because of their failure to believe in God's Son, they were of the world. What that means for us is this. If it did not matter in the grand scheme of things, whether you were related to Jesus or not, put differently, even if you were related to Jesus and you failed to place your trust in him, you were still of the world. What that means for you and for me is this. It matters very little if your grandparents grew up in church. It matters very little how much and how hard other people have prayed for you or how godly other people were in your lineage. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a Christian home. It doesn't even matter if you're the descendant of a faithful pastor or missionary. If you fail to believe in Jesus yourself, you are of the world. To put it in very concrete terms, even if you come from the most godly and the most Christian pedigree, if you personally fail to believe in Jesus, then you remain an enemy of God and not a friend of God. Even the half-brothers of Jesus did not get a pass for their failure to believe in Jesus. So Jesus goes to the festival, not according to the schemes of his brother, but according to the schedule of his father. And his hesitance to go to Jerusalem was well-founded, by the way. Jesus was not just being paranoid, being like, oh, I can't go down there because people are going to kill me. And, and it's like, well, Jesus, you're over-exaggerating. No, it says that the Jews in Jerusalem had a hawk eye out for him. They were looking for him. They were searching for him. They wanted, they wanted to deal with him. And then amongst the crowds, there was a division. Some people were saying that he is a good man, and other people were saying that he is a deceiver. And that brings us to the Jews failed to acknowledge his authority. The Jews failed to acknowledge his authority, verses 14 through 24. So Jesus travels from Galilee to Judea, from the north to the south in Israel, and he arrives in Jerusalem in the capital. Upon arriving in the capital, at some point during the midpoint of the festival, he made his way to the center of the capital, namely the temple in Jerusalem. And at that temple, he began to teach the crowds. And the religious leaders were amazed at the teaching of Jesus because he spoke with power, he spoke with skill, and he spoke with knowledge, even though he did not have what the text calls learning. All of the religious leaders who were at the, at, at, in one and the same breath wanting to kill Jesus and amazed at his teaching, all of those religious leaders would have been trained in the scriptures. They would have gone to Bible college, or seminary, as we might say. And here was a man who taught with authority 
and knowledge, and he had never trained at a rabbinical school, and he was never discipled by a renowned rabbi. And it was the practice of Jewish teachers to cite earlier rabbis to back up their claims. So just like today, and you know this if you're in high school, you're in college, university, whatever, if you're writing in an academic setting, you need to back up your claims. You can't just start saying things out of thin air, just hoping that you get a pass on your research paper. You have to make claims, back them up with credible sources, and then footnote them or endnote them, and then that gives, you, that gives credibility to your paper. That's why, for example, you shouldn't, could, and you can't in many settings, cite Wikipedia, because Wikipedia can be changed and edited by anyone who has access to the internet. It's not a credible source. So it was the practice of the Jewish rabbis to cite earlier rabbis. They said, I, I make this claim, and that's backed up by so-and-so way back where. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He doesn't appeal to any source. He doesn't appeal to any tradition. He doesn't appeal to any document. He doesn't appeal to any famous rabbi. Jesus says that his teaching comes from Almighty God. His teaching is full of knowledge, skill, and power because he is the Son sent from the Father, commissioned to speak divine words to the world. Jesus' teaching carries with it inherent authority because he speaks to the world divine words. Then here's the very simple application for you and for me. If Utah, as your friend, tells you, like gives you advice on some matter, you can take it or leave it. I tell you, hey, go check down this, check out this Chinese restaurant in wherever, Mississauga, I like it. You can take or leave that advice all day long. But when Jesus comes and he speaks to the world divine words, it is not a take it or leave it matter. We must come to Jesus, not on our terms, but on his and if Jesus is the Son of God sent from heaven to speak divine words to the world, then we must listen to him. Then he says something that is very insightful. And by the way, I think part of what John is doing here in this passage is this. Jesus was obviously making a splash in Jerusalem, in Judea, in all of Israel. And his very presence and his performing the miracles and his teaching was causing a splash. And it was causing offense across the nation. Just by his very presence, just by his very words, and just by the fact that he is performing works amongst the nation of Israel, it was causing a splash and it was causing offense. And there were people who, were, who believed in him, like 11 of the 12 disciples, there were some of the crowds who were ambivalent towards him, and there were others who strongly opposed him. There were different kinds of responses to Jesus, and Stephen will walk us through that next week at the end of chapter 7. But I think one of the things that John chapter 7, my passage, is doing is that it is identifying and dissecting some of these wrong responses to Jesus. And the reason why God would want you to see a wrong response to Jesus is so that you would not emulate that response. And the reason why God would not want you to emulate a negative response to his son is because God has set up the universe that all life is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And so if you reject Jesus, then you are rejecting God's provision of life for you. To misunderstand Jesus is deadly. So Jesus says something that's very, very insightful. It's really, really helpful. And, I'm, and I wouldn't necessarily say, this wouldn't be the first words out of my mouth to an unbeliever, but it's helpful to know that at the level of the heart, when a person comes face to face with the message of Jesus, and they reject it. This is what's happening. Jesus says that if you're a person who does not recognize Jesus, 
to be the Son of God, sent from heaven, commissioned to speak divine words to the world. If you're a person who does not recognize Jesus in that way, particularly if you're a person who has heard the message about Jesus, particularly if you're a person who has been exposed to the teachings of Jesus, and particularly if you have had your questions and objections answered and you still reject Jesus, the problem is not knowledge. It's not that you need more information before you can believe in him. It's not experiential. It's not a lack of seeing miracles. The problem with the person who rejects Jesus, who has been exposed to the teaching and the message of Jesus, is moral and spiritual. Because Jesus says, if you truly desire to do the will of the true and living God, then you will accept the true testimony concerning his son. In other words, if you desire to do God's will, then you will believe in the son. To put negatively, if you refuse to believe in Jesus, even after clear teaching, even after having your answer, questions and objections answered, and you still resolutely refuse to believe in Jesus, the problem is not a lack of knowledge, but a, the problem is a rebellion of the heart. That's why the unbeliever cannot receive Jesus as the Son of God sent from heaven to speak divine words to the world, because at the core of his heart is a heart that is in rebellion against God. Put it, to put it positively then, or to put it differently, if you're sitting in this room and you say, okay, well, I don't quite yet believe in Jesus, and you've told me that the reason why I don't believe in Jesus is because I have a rebellious heart against God. What, what, what should I do? What can I do? And let me put it positively. If you really want to know the truth about Jesus, you, you, you can't come to him in the posture of a judge, thinking that you can stand in judgment over the Son of God. You have to come to him with humility. If you really want to know the truth about Jesus, then you need to come to him with humility, with a readiness to hear what he says, even if it offends you at the most foundational level of who you are, and you have to come with a willingness to believe, receive, and submit to whatever he says. You can't have it both ways. You can't believe in Jesus, who claims to be the Son of God, the creator and the ruler of the universe, and the savior of the world, and then for you to approach him and act as if you are the judge and the sustainer and the ruler of the one who is the judge, creator, and sustainer of the world. You just can't have it both ways. If you come to God in pride, you will never receive the testimony concerning his son, which is to misunderstand Jesus, which is deadly for you. Now, I really despise border crossings, like at the border of, let's say, Canada and the U.S. Not because I don't like going into America, but it just stresses me out. You have to show your passport and your visa. You have to tell them the purpose of your trip. And then they ask you something like, well, what's the address that you're staying at? It's like, I don't know the address of my sister-in-law off the top of my head. Like, I'm not a criminal, I swear. Um, then you have to do an inventory of the food and what's in the trunk. And it's like the U.S., for example, I think receives apples but not oranges. I don't know why. They both have seeds. But, and, then, and then you want to be honest, right? Like, we're Christians. We want to tell the truth and not break one of the commandments. <laughs> But you, but you also don't want to, you only want to divulge what's necessary. Like you don't want to give the guy your life story and then all of a sudden you're inside being interrogated. <laughs> now there are some things in that context that you would never say as a joke. And, um, you know, so I, th I think mo more, most often we just tell our boys to be quiet as opposed to telling them what they can and can't say. But there's cer certain things that you just never say, like, like drugs or smuggling or bomb. Even as a joke. And there are certain things that you should have never said to the religious elite in Israel. And just, just like you would never shout bomb at the airport. And if you do that, even if it's just a joke, you deserve to be kicked out and you know why that is. But 
The only time that you would shout bomb in an airport is if there was an explosive nearby. Then it would be perfectly legitimate. And to shift the use of the metaphor, Jesus throws a perfectly legitimate bomb into the crowds at the temple. He says this to the religious leaders. Has not Moses given you the law? Not offensive. Yet none of you keeps the law greatly offensive. Why do you seek to kill me? Now, remember, the religious leaders prided themselves in knowing and keeping the law of Moses. They were disciples of Moses, and they were fastidious keepers of the law. So, just remember that. Jesus is talking, I think he's directing his words at the religious elite or the religious leaders in the capital, in Jerusalem, at, like on their home turf, at the temple. They prided themselves in being knowers and keepers of the law of Moses. And Jesus tells them, in no uncertain words, not mincing his words, you're lawbreakers. And beyond that, you're bloodthirsty murderers. Now, that probably didn't go off very well. And it, d- it doesn't in the text. And, the cur- and, and so then, so remember, there's three parties, right? There's Jesus, and then there are the religious leaders, and then there's sort of the crowds. And the crowds are a little bit taken back, and they're, and they're a little bit, I think, confused at, wor- at best, and they're siding with the religious leaders at worst. But they say, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And in one sense, it's not an unfair question from the crowds. Because Jesus had been standing there and teaching for quite a while, and nobody had apprehended him, nobody had arrested him, nobody had tried to harm him, nobody had laid their hands on him. And so from the crowd's perspective, Jesus' words, why do you seek to kill me, would have seemed exaggerated, dramatic, out of place. If you were amongst the crowds, you maybe didn't know what Jesus was talking about. But if you were amongst the religious leaders in Jerusalem, you knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Because the last time that Jesus was in Jerusalem, you remember from John 5, he performed a miracle. He told a man to pick up his pallet and walk, and it was on the Sabbath. And when the religious leaders confronted Jesus, they, he defied their authority. He claimed to be the unique son of God. And so from the religious leader's perspective, Jesus deserves to be killed. And they have been looking for him. And that's what Jesus is referring to. The words of Jesus are not exaggerated. The words of Jesus are not out of place. They are accurate and on target. And Jesus is bringing up what took place last time he was in Jerusalem um, to point out their hypocrisy. Let me demonstrate to you their hypocrisy. At a most basic level, they were planning to commit murder. And any second grader would have been able to tell you Hey, that is a violation of the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. But at a more complicated level, the Jewish leaders were bent out of shape because according to them, Jesus was breaking the fourth commandment, thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. And Jews take this very seriously. If you go to Israel today, not that you'd want to, but if you went to Israel today, and you were to stay in a hotel, and you were there on a Sabbath, on a Saturday, and it was a multi-floor hotel, and you were on the 20th floor, and that was where your room was, and you wanted to take the elevator, I am told that on a Saturday, so that you do not have to break Sabbath, the elevator stops on every floor, so that nobody has to press a button, because that would be considered work. Now, the comical thing is, Look, listen, um, I would think that 
if you were staying on the 20th floor, to stand there for 20 floors as the elevator goes up, you know, supporting your own body weight would be more work than to do this. <laughs> but so I'm told that's what they do in Israel. So how dare Jesus tell a man, or sorry, how dare Jesus heal a man on the Sabbath and then tell him to pick up his pallet and walk? But I have two questions, okay? And, and Jesus would have had these questions. I'm just parroting him. So, Jews, so religious leaders, so what happens if your sheep falls into a ditch on a Saturday? Well, they, they, they would go and help the poor thing out of the ditch and not be like, well, actually, it's a Sabbath, sheepy. So uh, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> they don't do that. So another question, what, what, if, what happens if a boy was born on a Saturday? And you're like, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, it's got everything to do with this passage. Because um, if a mother had a son on a Saturday, um, then she needed to have that son circumcised on the eighth day. And the ways that the Jews would have done their calculations, the eighth day from a Saturday was the following Saturday, which would have been a Sabbath. And Jesus' argument here is this. If a boy, or I should, sorry, let me back up. The Jew, so if a boy was born on a Saturday, then he needed to be circumcised on the following Saturday, which was a Sabbath. And there was a, a, a second century rabbi that said this. So great is circumcision that it overrides even the rigor of Sabbath. In other words, according to the second century rabbi, if the boy is born on a Saturday, just circumcise him on the following Saturday. That's okay. And the religious leaders had no qualms about circumcising a baby boy on the eighth day, even if it fell on the Sabbath, because they viewed circumcision so highly. They viewed circumcision as a perfecting right. It perfected the boy. And so Jesus' argument is from the lesser to the greater. If you regularly make an exception so that male boys can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that he can undergo a perfecting rite? How much more should an exception be made for the Son of God as he makes a whole man well on the Sabbath? Let me be very clear. This is not one rabbinical school's thought up against another rabbinical school's thought. This is not Jesus arguing with the religious leaders on a finer point of doctrine. This is Jesus pointing out the ridiculousness of the religious leaders. They claim to be disciples of Moses, but are eagerly seeking to break the command not to murder because Jesus has supposedly broken the command to keep the Sabbath. Even though they themselves regularly break the Sabbath to rescue their sheep, and circumcise their sons. They have no place for Jesus who makes a man, whole man well on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Here is the thing, and here is where it ties in with us. The religious leaders can make up all the excuses in the world as to why they don't believe in Jesus. They could rationalize their rejection of him. They made it a religious matter, didn't they? They said, we can't receive you because you break Sabbath. At the end of the day, something was wrong with the religious leaders at the level of the heart that caused them not only to reject Jesus on these ridiculous grounds, but led them to put plans in motion to put him to death. To misunderstand Jesus is deadly. It's really important for us to see this. According to the whole nation, according to the entirety of the people of God, the most religious people in all the world 
would have been these religious leaders who were opposing Jesus and desiring to put him to death. Friend, I, I know it's becoming less and less popular to be religious in this country, at least in a formal way, but I think it's worthwhile issuing a call and a warning. Being religious does not equate to truly knowing God. The only way to truly know God is through his son Jesus and to receive his words. And as long as you fail to hear and believe the words of Jesus, you will reject him and you will cast him out of your life, which is detrimental for you. If you do that, that's your choice. And we live in a free country with the freedom of religion, and I have no desire to coerce your conscience into the beliefs of Christianity. But I want to make one thing clear. That is a volitional choice on your part. And your rejection of Jesus is not for a lack of knowledge. Your rejection of Jesus is not because he hasn't performed a miracle for you. The diagnosis of this text is that if you reject Jesus after being exposed to his teaching and to who he is and why he came, and you still re are resolutely rejecting him, rejecting him, it's because your heart is in rebellion against God and you do not want to give up control of your life and destiny and you want to hang on to it for dear life which will lead to your death. Third, let us see that the Jews failed to understand his mission. 725 through 36 the Jews fail to misunderstand, or to, the Jews fail to understand his mission. There was a common understanding amongst the Jews that when the Messiah would come, he would sort of a, he would be born of flesh and blood, so he'd be a human being, but he'd kind of sort of like rise up out of nowhere, sort of mysteriously, like out of nowhere, kind of like rise up and become, you know, a star of sorts. And the crowds are sort of responding to that kind of understanding and saying, well, how could he be the Messiah? Because we, we know where this one's from. We, we know where he's from. So how could he be the Messiah if he, the Messiah is supposed to kind of just appear and show up mysteriously? We know, we know him. And when they said we know him, what that was probably a reference to was that they knew who his parents were. They knew who his family was. They knew that he was from Nazareth. And some may have even known that he was born in Bethlehem. So in that sense, the crowds know where Jesus is from. But the question must be asked, do they really know where he is from? Yes, they know his address in Nazareth. But do they know his address in heaven? Do, do the religious leaders and the crowds in Jerusalem and this gathering in Georgetown, do you understand that Jesus is the Son of God sent from heaven to accomplish a divine mission? And Jesus spoke, spoke to the crowds and he throws another legitimate bomb into their midst. Remember, these people prided themselves in the fact that they were Jewish. These people would have prided themselves in their piety and in their godliness. Remember, they had a lot of them had traveled from all across Israel to the capital in Jerusalem, probably for the third time over that calendar year, for the sake of religious activity. They, unlike Canadians, were very proud to be religious and externally so. And he says to them, hey, you don't know God. The only one that knows God is the one whom God sent into the world and that one is standing right in front of you. What an offensive thing to say to the crowds. And in the midst of all of that, some in the crowds became convinced. Maybe due to the power of his teaching. Maybe due to connections that they were making between his miracles and his identity. But some in the crowds believed in him. But not so amongst the religious leaders. They dug their heels in and they opposed him all the more. 
They sought to arrest him, and they tried to lay their hands on him so that they could kill him. But remember, Jesus operated according to a divine timetable, meaning that their attempts, even though they were the most powerful men in all the land, their attempts to arrest a single man were futile because his hour had not yet come. But his hour was fast approaching. Look with me to verse 33. I will be with you a little while longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. And Jesus is talking here about his departure out of this world. He was sent from the Father into the world, and he was about to depart out of the world back to the Father. And Jesus says, once that takes place, You'll look for me, but I will be gone. You will seek me, but you, I cannot be found. And where I go, you can't come. And the religious leaders were just completely confused at this point. They had not a clue what Jesus was saying. And what they thought was that, oh, he's going to go and he's going to leave not just Judea, but he's going to leave Galilee and he's going to go to the diaspora and then he's going to go and preach to the Greek proselytes. And so that's why we won't be able to find him shortly, late, shortly after this. But that's not what Jesus meant. And what is amazing in this whole encounter, because remember, okay, there was a small contingent amongst the crowds where it said that they believed in him, but exactly the depth of their belief and trust in him were not told. Um, and remember that it, even amongst the, the crowds that, supposedly believed in him and supposedly uh, um, followed him. Many of them were the ones who were crying out, crucify him, crucify him, uh, closer to his crucifixion. But just imagine this. Jesus is the Son of God, the Spirit-anointed Messiah, the fulfillment of all the scriptures and the promises of the Old Testament. He is coming to rescue Israel and the world. His own brothers rejected him. The leaders of Israel rejected him. And even his own people, the nation of Israel, by and large, at best, were confused about him. Even then, the Son of God, sent from heaven, was not going to be diverted from his Father's plan. Jesus was the Son of God sent from heaven to speak divine words, and Jesus was the Son of God sent from heaven to accomplish a divine mission. And for Jesus to travel from this world back to the Father, there was an appointed layover at the cross of Calvary. For Jesus to return to the Father successfully with a mission-accomplished stamp, he had to return to glory via the cross. This is why the expectations of his brothers and of the crowds were misguided and mistaken. Jesus' family wanted their big brother to gain a stronger support base and regain his fame. The crowds sought Jesus because they wanted a free lunch. They wanted to see another miracle. And perhaps for many of them, they wanted freedom from political oppression from Rome. And I borrow this insight from Mike Bullmore, but Jesus in this passage was testifying to the world that its deeds were evil. He was doing that with courage. He was doing that with conviction. And I think in some sense, he was doing that out of compassion. But even as he is declaring to the world that its deeds are evil, he is marching one foot after another onward to the cross to die for those very same evil deeds of the world. Jesus came to be the savior of the people of the world, of men and women, of boys and girls, of Jews and Gentiles. He came to be the savior of all those who would rightly understand who he is and what he came to do and therefore place their whole confidence and trust in him. And here is the pointed application 
for those who live in the modern age in the 21st century, as long as you want to have the final say in this discussion, you will inevitably misunderstand who Jesus is. And insofar as you misunderstand who Jesus is, that is deadly for you. Because if you misunderstand who he is, it will cause you to reject him. And if you reject him, then you're cutting yourself off from the only source of life and salvation in all the world. And if you cut yourself off from life, then you will remain dead in your sins because you do not have Jesus, the source of all life in all the world. What you do with the person, the work, the message, the teaching, and the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ has the most profound implications for your life, both now and to eternity. What you do with the person and the message of Jesus has everlasting consequences. You do not want to trifle with the question, who is Jesus and what is his significance for my life? You want to get that question right. And the place that I would suggest that you go to learn about Jesus, who is the Son of God, sent into the world to speak divine words to the world and to accomplish the divine mission given to him by the Father to accomplish redemption for the world, the person that you should ask about who he is and what he came to do and that significance for your life, the person that you should ask is Jesus as he has revealed himself to us graciously through his word. As the great Augustine was told during the account of his conversion, tolelege, tolelege, pick up and read, pick up and read, read the gospel of John and believe in the Jesus that you hear of and find in there and have everlasting life, both today and forevermore. What an awesome thing it is to have life in his name, to be a Christian. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Because of the grace of God in Jesus. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much that we have hearts that are set free to love you. I thank you so much for each person in this room, for my brothers, for my sisters in Christ, and also for my friends who don't yet know Jesus. I pray that those who do not yet know Jesus, who are connected to this church, who are affiliated with this church, that you would be at work in their hearts to convince them of the beauty and the truth of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would lead them to belief in his name. And I pray that upon believing that you would grant them life in his name. And that their lives would be different and changed forever and a day. Father, it is such a privilege to be a Christian. Thank you that you have worked in our hearts and in our lives to lead us to belief in your son. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.